There you go. Quick, Chris, come run around to the thing here and we'll, we'll get everyone. We got a few seconds before exactly straight up 1700 and then, and then uh, we, can, we can officially start the, the big show. There so, you go. Oh, the crap. There's, I hate these ads in this thing, but we're, we're going to, I always eliminate the mid-roll ads, but I can't do it immediately. I got to wait until the video goes live. So anyway. There you go. Can everybody hear us? That's right. Hey, everybody. This is Matt. And we're at Texas Toast Guitars. Thanks for watching our Thursday live Q&A. We've got a couple of new things. Um, we have new microphones today, so I want to make sure everybody can hear us. Um, and if, if there's a problem hearing, we can turn up or turn down, or we can always revert back to the old microphone if it gets... Yeah, we can do that. Um, if somebody is too loud or somebody is too quiet, <laughs> um, we, can, we can change volumes on the mics too. So, yeah, so, so we're, we're doing a little, bit of a, a little bit of a test here. And we're, we're, again, it's live TV. We're working without a net. Yep. And, uh, yeah, and, and with no crew. Sometimes True. working without a net is one thing. Working without a yeah. net or a crew is yeah. a completely different I'm the crew. Of fish. Uh, does, uh, does, does anyone every, say? Everybody that? says balance is good, sounds good. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, here. Oh, that's always, there always you go. handy. See how that works. So, guys, this is the thing that we're going to start doing every Thursday at uh, 5 o'clock Mountain Time on the days that we're not doing an online class. Um, so, usually those are the first first Thursdays of the month, but every other Thursday at the same time we would normally be doing an online class, we're going to be doing these because we get a lot of questions from y'all during, you know, like uh, on in, in video questions and things like that or in, um, uh, in the live stream where it's just you and I just kind of getting drunk and goofing around <laughs> um, that we don't, we don't answer a lot of guitar building questions. So this is a very, I don't know if it's very serious, but a more serious uh, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, uh, a more serious format for answering your questions about specific to guitar building and guitar repair. Um, so I would ask that you guys put at least one question mark in front of a question if you have something. The more you put, like if you put three or four, that will help us go, oh yeah, that's one that is, that's a question that somebody has that would help us out quite a bit. It really does work really, really well. Yeah. It helps me out a ton because then I don't have to read every single comment. Not that I don't want to. Yeah. Speaking but. of helping us out quite a bit, I'd like to quick thank our sponsors, which we'll talk more about as we go. I'd like to thank the good people at Flipside Music, the great American guitar store. Go down there and uh, give Ike and Dylan and uh, Nico some shit and tell them the guys at Texas Toast said to do it. Uh, thank you to Bitterroot Guitars. Uh, they sell a lot of guitar parts that we use. Um, and if you type in T-X-T-O-A-S-T -T at checkout, you'll get 15% off, which that saves you some money. So thank you to John and Cheryl at Bitterroot Guitars. I'd like to thank Dan and the crew at Guitarwood Experts. Um, it is my understanding that uh, Texas Toast 15 still works for 15% off your order from Guitarwood Experts. So check those guys out and let me know. Um, and like the, go ahead. Call them if you want something because their website is yep. chronically out of date, but they it's always hard to, have stuff. And if you call yeah. them and you talk to Dan, yep, he can round up what you want. Yeah, that's the that's the cool thing is that Dan knows exactly what's going on, and if he doesn't, Calvin does. Um, I'd like to thank Mike Learn at Mike Learn Airbrush, and uh, if you haven't subscribed to his YouTube channel, please go check Mike out, and uh, he's got lots and lots and lots of good stuff. And if you need a new airbrush. There's talk that Mike is in uh, has some some new new uh, uh, new airbrush stuff coming out like mer like parts and 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 actual tools that you can use if you want to get into airbrushing. Finally, I'd like to thank our good friends at SimTech Coding for helping us out bringing you this um, this live stream. If you guys would like to become a sponsor of the Texas Toast live Q and A on Thursdays, please send me an email and we can make that happen. So. Uh, enough with that are we ready to jump into questions Chris? uh yeah i think so okay. uh we <laughs> um we might be we might be clipping a little bit talking so just i might talk. be too loud then oh. I, I think that i think so that i i'm always i always yell it's just the way i talk and everyone it's harder for me to kind of mellow out yeah so turn maybe turn down yours one click yeah i'm gonna see. turn i'm gonna turn my microphone down one okay Okay. Okay. Let's and try I'm that talk and see at the if that's regular... any better. And let me know if that's yeah. better. Yeah. Let me know if you guys can still hear me, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. Okay. You, let's uh, let's start with the questions. You got. Some? All right. The first one. Hey guys, 
Best way to flow, flow coat over clear. Ooh, that one's for you, Chris. Yeah. Um, flow coat over clear. I, I believe you're talking about uh, doing something with lacquer. And we don't use lacquer. We don't really shoot flow coats. Um, so I couldn't really help you with that. Um, but let's talk about, but you've sprayed a lot of lacquer. Yeah. So the, the, I think the whole, the, the notion of getting a nice smooth layer of paint at the, for the very last is what yeah. you're looking for there. Um, right? I always I think, tried I to get a nice smooth even coat of paint on every coat. Yeah. of paint. Um, That's true. I remember you're... when we first started using sealer, I was like, we'll just hog it on there and we'll sand it off later. And you're like, nah, uh, uh Yeah. I always try and get everything as smooth as I possibly can with every step. That way I don't have to go back and either sand a lot or, or do something like a flow coat. I think um, lacquer guys sometimes will spray an overly reduced mm -hmm. final round and hope that it sort of lays out and and kind of kind of just smooths everything out, I can um, tell but you I've never done that. One thing that helped us out more than anything else when it came to spraying clear was get the best possible gun you can for clear. Would you not agree? Yeah, I would agree. And I would, um, a lot of people I think just think that, that paint comes out of a gun just the way it comes out. Yep. When really you can, uh, there's a lot of settings that you can do and there's a lot of things, air pressure, um, you know, just knowing the gun and using the gun and, and, and playing around with it a little bit before you start to shoot. If you're, if you're ending up with a lot of orange peel, rather than continue and think I'll fix it later, you should just stop and figure out why you're getting a lot of orange peel mm -hmm. and then, and then paint the guitar. As much as, you know, you want to get the guitar done, you don't want to have to sand it and start over what again. Do you think you get too much orange peel, too too much pressure. Yeah, too much air, not enough, enough, not enough material. Yeah, too much, too much um, reducer, or yeah. if you're using lacquer thinner. It could be the wrong. Yeah, it could be the wrong thinner for us. When we were shooting lacquer, um, it's really hot and really dry here in the summer, mm -hmm. and that lacquer would dry almost before it hit the guitar if you weren't careful, and you almost couldn't put enough reducer in or thinner in it, and you certainly you can't buy lacquer thinner like you used to be able to in speeds where it would evaporate very slowly or very quickly depending on the on the conditions you, think you, you can't or you think we just didn't i ever could look not ever it. find <laughs> it look i okay. looked and looked and looked and you just can't buy it anymore because nobody really shoots that much lacquer anymore yeah. certainly not any any big quantities of it so i'm sure you could probably buy it in giant containers from a manufacturer but we weren't those guys. So, We're not those guys. Yeah. So get the get the best possible spray gear you can, and and learn to use it. I everyone wants the tricks of the trade, and that one's one of the that one's one of the things where there there's no trick. Just keep practicing, and you'll you'll get better. So. Yep. Yeah. And uh, I still screw up. We all do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next question. Frets, what tools do you use and a quick rundown of your process? Um, okay, so the most important thing I think about frets is I stopped using a hammer to get frets into the slot about a decade ago. And um, I was late to the party there. But um, I have an arbor press with a, with a specific call that's radius the same as the, uh, the fretboard that I use and I actually press them in that way. Um, depending on what, what kind of, of fret wire you're using, um, if you're using regular nickel steel or something with, you know, stainless frets are different than nickel steel frets and you'll, you'll have to use more tools to do stainless. And when I say more, I mean, you'll have to replace your tools more often um, because they just don't last as long. Um, so I would use, I use a, I bend the fret wire um, I cut it to size. I undercut the tangs as if I had binding, even if I don't. Um, I have a Jeskar fret nipper that I use. I did a video on that. If you go back and, and do a search for Jeskar fret nipper on the, on the channel, you'll see what tool I'm talking about. Um, Stumac makes some too. They're, they're pretty good. Um, but the Jeskar one to me is far and away superior to even the old Klein ones that 
that we have. Uh, then I press them in with an arbor press, and um, yeah, that's so. That's did I miss anything? You think? Uh, no. Well, I think this would be a good time to talk about our next uh, oh, yeah. class, our next big Thursday online deep dive class. That's right. Which is, is uh, this this the first Thursday in November, which I think is the second or third. Uh huh. Um, it's. Uh, Fretting and uh, fret wire and fretting and installation and we're going to talk about pressing in frets, cutting frets to size, undercutting tangs. Uh, we're going to do a neck. We're going to level and dress the frets. We're going to clean up the ends and we're going to basically take a neck not unlike this one and uh, fret it. Now this has been this has been uh, radiused. But hasn't been fretted, and uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do the whole shooting match, right, Chris? Yeah, we sure are. Cool. Yeah, I think that's gonna be a fun one. So the online classes are really neat, guys, and it gives you a chance to to um, kind of come to a class without coming to a class. Because I realize it's hard right now for people to come to the shop, you know, because of the COVID deal or whatever, or they just don't feel safe. So we started offering these online classes, and they've been really, really fun. Um, if you want to find out more about the online classes, whether it's the fretting um, class or any of the stuff that we've done in the past, those are all available <clears throat> in the archive section, and you can buy those. It, sometimes they're reduced cost. Sometimes that they're at the same money because there's deals associated with um, <clears throat> the, the classes. So, for example, the last one that we did was a template class, and our buddies at guitarbuildingtemplates.com, see you, Mac, um, at guitarbuildingtemplates.com gave us a 20% off code. And if you, um, if you sign up for the class, you get the discount code. And that is good through December 31st of this year. So that discount code is still good for another couple of months anyway. So check yeah. that one out. It's all available at texastoastguitars.com under the classes section. Yeah, and, it, and this fret one I think is going to be really good. Yep. I think it's going to be really worth everybody's time and money. You might think, ah, 20 bucks to watch these knuckleheads. Yeah. But we're going to talk about not just installing frets in a new neck. We'll, we'll dive into removing frets, mm, cool. um, replacing individual frets maybe a little bit. Uh, we're going to go from, from brand new frets to fully dressed and polished frets, which is a good thing to know how to do. Mm -hmm. And really, 20 bucks you can, and some tools you can do it yourself and save yourself a bunch of money yeah. uh, later on down the road. You can be everybody's favorite guy because you know how to do fret work. When we do the, the, the do it, you know, cutting a new nut for your guitar, that, that'll be a good one. That'll too. be a good one too, yeah. I don't know when that yeah. one's coming up, but yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know either. Um, but uh, yeah. Cool. There you go. Um, somebody uh, asked, um, how would you seal a guitar to prepare? How would you seal a guitar to prepare it for a swirl finish? I would absolutely, unequivocally, 100% say Simtech EZ Sanding Sealer. 2050 is the, yep. is 2850, the number. 2850, right? 2850. It's clear. It, it's the, call up the guys at Simtech and say, I want what the guys at Texas Toast have. And they'll know exactly what you're talking about. And we're not the only ones who use it. There are uh, lots and lots and lots of companies who use that exact product in 55 gallon drums, they buy it so much. You've heard of all these guys. They don't want me to tell you who they are, but you know all the names. Yeah, So yeah, and it's- it, Some of can... them rhyme with say, Blender, <laughs> Maxon, <laughs> um, you know, Pamer, uh -huh. um, e, e, e. C. Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> um, some some companies like that. Uh, yeah. There, yeah, there's some a of your lot, favorites. Some of your favorites. Bretch. <laughs> um, yeah, they, yeah, I'm not going to name any names, but yeah, maybe yeah, they rhyme with some of these. Yeah, yeah. and it, you can spray it on, you can brush it on, yeah. you can roll it on. Um, if you had a bat of it that was big enough, you, you could, could dip dunk it. it in there. Sure. Um, you can put it on thick, you can put it on not so thick, but it'll seal everything up and get you ready for whatever kind of finish you want to put on. Um, have you, you ever do done any like hydro dip top stuff? Like I've that? never done that. I haven't um, it, it's fun to watch. I think it would be, I, I don't really want to try it. I'm not, I, yeah, I don't really have any desire to do it. There's a lot of people who do it. 
you know, you, you kind of get known for whatever you do. And, and so we become the, the fabric top guys and the, the, the pinstripe guy or whatever we, you know, the pin router guys. Um, my friend Mark Funk in Florida is kind of the swirl paint job guy. So I don't, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Cool. So uh, Bob Quigley thinks uh, you can probably use uh, easy sanding sealer to seal just about anything. I would be surprised if you couldn't. I, I, uh, our friend John, uh, Sergeant <laughs> Bishop, sealed up his countertops at his house with them. I forget what they were. I but think he, it was some sort of butcher block. But yeah, he yeah, wanted he, something that you could wipe off and, and mm -hmm. yeah, and have it and sterilize it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, okay. Here's a good question. Okay. Uh, I sanded my kit guitar a few too many times, mm -hmm. and the neck is too high now. Route the pocket deeper or plane the neck heel thinner? So you sanded the body too many times and now, yes. okay. Um, the, it depends on what tools you got, you know? Um, if you just have sandpaper and a block and are really careful, you can, you can sand the heel area and, um, and that would be the way to go to a point. Um, the other option would be if you have a router to make the neck pocket a little deeper. The other option would be to see if you can't make your bridge sit lower. I don't know what kind of kit you have, but... Sit higher. No, have the bridge sit lower because the neck is too... Oh, wait, yes, yeah, so the neck is too high. So the bridge, yeah. yeah, you could shim the bridge. I would question how much sanding did you do? How did you yeah. sand this that it got that far off? And yeah. maybe you're not as far off as you think you are. Um, if it's a like a fender style bolt-on neck, mm -hmm. you could also just put a little bit of a shim in the, in the heel and probably get that neck angle Well, that would make it worse, right. wouldn't it? Shim in the heel would, would... Yeah, it would make it worse, yeah. wouldn't it? You'd Never have to mind. Shim, you'd have to Forget shim the that. bridge. Yeah, you wouldn't, yeah, shim you wouldn't the bridge. do that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah but I, I, man, you'd have to have removed a lot of meat. Yeah, I mean, because you're talking about... Option two, add, add more mass to the top. Yeah, you could do that. Now is a good time to learn how to put a top on a guitar body. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, that, that's a good one. I, I, I'd like to know how you did that. Yeah. But if you... Yeah, I, I would say that e the least amount of tools required would be to... Sandpaper and a block on the heel. So yeah, that'd be that'd be what I'd go with. Yep. Okay. All righty then. Are All we? Right. Is anyone saying that they were too loud? I'm um, too loud. Or there was a there was a little bit turn mat back up, so I turned down. Okay. So now we're at the same level again because everybody liked the balance, but I think we were clipping. So. Oh. Oh. Okay. So I think okay. we're good now. Okay. Did anyone notice that in the last one of these, I annotated all of the questions in the, uh, in the bottom? That was, that was kind of fun. I've not done that before. It was a lot of extra work that I don't normally like to do, but I figured on something like this, it was a good idea to do. So I hope that you guys liked that or noticed it or used it or whatever. I don't, I don't know. We got any other questions? Uh, I'm not seeing. I got some, some questions via the internet. Okay. I, well, I, no. So, oh. okay. Yeah, go ahead. I'm not seeing Randy King's questions. That's why oh, I'm not oh, ans okay. We're looking asking for Randy King's questions. Um, okay, so this one comes in from email. It is, uh, let's say, uh, from uh, Jerome. Uh, hi, Matt. I have a couple questions for you on the Thursday Q&A. Yeah, yeah. First, what does an orange drop capacitor do? What is it for? And second, what does it matter if it's 0.022 or 0.047? Okay. Uh, finally, is it worth upgrading the wiring and or pots and or switch of a cheap guitar? Uh, I have upgraded the pickups of my cheapest guitar, but not the wiring pots and switch. So, um, first of all, let me say, let me, let's address the upgrade one. Uh, only you can say whether or not it's worth upgrading. Um, but I would, for, for the amount of money that you'll spend upgrading it, I would say go for it. You know what I mean? We're, you're not talking about that much money. If you had a hundred guitars to do, probably not. But if it's just one, you're like under twenty bucks probably to upgrade the pots and 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 a switch, you know, something like that. On a Les Paul, you're you're looking at more, but yeah, um, a, a capacitor is the, the tone circuit on a guitar is is what is 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 all about the capacitor, okay? And um, 
the, uh, so what does it do? Uh, it basically cuts the highs and kind of makes the guitar sound like you got it in a chokehold. I hate tone controls on guitars, but a lot of people love them. Um, so so that, that's what it does. Yeah, as you roll the tone off, the, the higher the number on the capacitor, the darker the guitar will sound when the tone is all the way at one. So when you roll the tone roll all the, the way all back. All the way back, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then depending on the, um, on the, the, the pot itself, uh, will determine how it sounds in various stages throughout that. Yeah, and so um, you can switch around with yeah. different, diff you know, typically for a single coil, 250K pot. Mm -hmm. For humbucker, 500k, but you can switch. You don't. It's not. It's not set. In yeah, stone. You, can, you can. Yeah, most people, most single coil guitars have a 0.047 capacitor in the tone control, and most humbuckers have a 0.022 because they're already a little darker sounding, and you don't. You just don't need that much. Now you can get the same amount of sound out of both at, at some of those middle positions. It's just that all the way rolled down yeah. will be more dramatic with the higher value cap. Yeah. Does that make sense? I would, I, if it was me and it was like, I'm going to upgrade my, my capacitors in my guitar to the orange drop kind, I'd be like, nah, I don't even bother. Yeah, and really... Uh, I would rather have a nice potentiometer or switch yeah, than a nice yeah. capacitor. Yeah, and, and the capacitor um, makes little to no difference when it's all the way up. Yeah. Um, it, there's, there's a little bit because you're running it into another pot and through another pot, but when that pot's all the way up, the, amount, the, the capacitor doesn't, doesn't change that sound. So putting in a really, really expensive uh, capacitor and never rolling it down at all makes no sense at all. Yeah. And it doesn't really change the, the sound of the guitar until you do start using that yep. uh, capacitor. I'm of the opinion that for the most part, a capacitor is a capacitor and you can spend really, really boutique money on mm -hmm. a capacitor, or you can spend a buck, and you're going to end up at the same place. I, um, I think so, too. Of course, someone will say, oh, you guys yeah, are totally full well, of shit. Yeah, yeah I, but I don't think it is because it's, 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 there's, there's no real juice running through a, a guitar. It's not an amp yeah. where that does actually make a difference. Yeah, if you want to do tone shaping, do it with the amp. Well, yeah, but, but you know, putting, in, putting cheap capacitors into an amp is not as good of an idea as, as using cheap ones in your guitar mm. um, because they actually they store energy they, they actually yeah, do yeah, something yeah. and capacitors you know the way that they're rated is you have your you know 0.022 and then, then it's within 10 percent mm -hmm. so that you know um, and so yeah if you had a two 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 and a four seven yeah and they were on the high and low ends yeah. of the of the uh uh margin of error they could be basically the same well so an o two two within ten percent high would be like point o two five okay you know and the other way would be point o four whatever okay. o, you know yeah. so but i guess i guess the point is that they're they're pretty strictly controlled, and what it says on it is what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. um, I saw uh, a big electronics house got all sorts of capacitors and tested them all and ranked them all and and rated them all, and they were all well within their ratings. Most of them were within. Oh, 5%. I remember that. Yeah, and it just in a guitar, it doesn't make any difference. Boy, there, there's there's it's funny that like that like a a one cent or $10 piece is something that people will argue about and yeah, argue yeah. about. And we've talked about that one topic more than, than any of the other mm -hmm. stuff because it's such, it's such kind of mojo when it comes to guitar stuff. What sort of caps? Yeah. It doesn't, I don't think it matters. I don't, th especially if you're not, and, and neither one of us are, are, are I don't tone, think you should have a tone, tone knob, knob anyway. Yeah. And so if we do have a tone knob, it's all the way up. Yep. And, yeah, so, so typically when I buy caps for us to use, I buy .033s because they're mm -hmm. right in the middle, mm -hmm. and then I can use them on humbucker guitars and yeah. single coils. I don't have to have two of them, uh, so, yeah. And we buy orange drop capacitors because when you look inside, people want to see that, but I don't, I, don't, I don't use them because I think they're the hot 
hot ticket. I, yeah. I buy them because that's what people expect. All well, right. the, and the funny thing about orange drops is in the hi-fi stereo world, mm -hmm. um, they are, they're, they're considered really good. And in the vintage amp world, they're considered really bad. <laughs> <laughs> so... Yeah, I don't know. You know, yeah. Oh, but in your guitar, really good. Yeah. Amp, really bad. Vintage stereo, really good. Yeah. So, there you go. All right. Thanks All for right. sending yeah. us the email questions. Yeah. If any of you guys want to send me email questions, you can. I can't guarantee we're going to get to all of them because I really want you guys who are watching and participating to, um, to get your questions answered. And I realize we spent a bunch of time talking about caps, but... Yeah. Okay, Randy King. Hey, Randy. Please walk me through how you'd make a tele neck with the router and edge guide. I have neck blanks and a pre-slotted radius boards. I bet I bought fret wire as well. Okay, how to, uh, how to it, make a tele neck with a router and a, I think he's talking about having a template. Okay, yeah, and, and a pattern cutting bit. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Randy, I, I know I've seen the shop where you're working out of, Randy, and I'm betting that you have a router table. Um, if you don't, I want you to go buy a piece of plywood and bolt your router to it and you and build your own router table. It doesn't have to be fancy. It just has to work, you know, for, for what we're doing. Um, so what you would need to do is you need to start with something like this. You've got your template, draw it out on your blank um, and cut it out as closely as you possibly can. Gosh, this, this question really, th this deserves a lot of, okay, I, I, I'm gonna, I don't wanna gloss over this too much, but we've covered it a little bit and we're gonna cover it again. So I wanna, there's a, to say what's the, walk me through how to do it. All right, well, the, 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 body, the, the, the body of the neck, the neck itself has to be the right thickness, usually three quarters of an inch. Um, and it has to be flat on both sides. And when I say flat, I don't mean like, well, that'll probably be okay. I mean, it's gotta be dead flat. Um, so the first thing that you need to do if you're working in my shop is you cut out the perimeter of the guitar neck as close as you can to the line, and then you clean it up with the router and the pattern cutting bit. Now, if you're putting the truss rod in with your router table and a fence, you need to put the truss rod in first because you want to have a flat edge for your fence to ride on. In other words, if you say, here, I got this, now put the truss rod in it. Well, what's it gonna ride on in the fence? Now, the way, the way that I do it is with the pin router and I have a template that I made that the pin follows on this side and the cutter cuts on this side and that puts my channel for my truss rod in. That's the kind of truss rod that I use. If you're using a vintage truss rod and you need to put a scoop in it, you need to figure out how to do that. Um, so yeah, and then you need to have an access for the truss rod. I do most of mine at the headstock these days, but you can also do it at the heel and you need to drill or route for that. Um, and I'm assuming you're talking about a fender neck. If you have a Gibson neck, you need to do some sort of an angle here, or of course on the fender, you need to have that same scoop too. Um, yeah, so that, that really seems like something that I should probably do in a whole video. Just cover that in a video, because it's, it's way too much to just, hey, tell me how to do this. Well, yeah. uh, okay, um, I don't think I can, I, I think I can say it all, and I might even be able to remember all the steps, but I know it's going to miss something in, in just me saying it. You know what I mean? I think that might be a good, a good topic for a video. Now, if you are into it, we do have a class coming up in the middle of December, which is in the weeds with guitar necks. We might do some neck shaping, but it's mostly going to be profiling the neck. And um, it actually includes a blank like this that you get to fret and profile. Um, but I think we should... I think we should probably do a video about how you just make a neck using, using tools that you have, not the pin router. That might be a fun video to do. Yeah, kind of yeah. do an old school way to do it. Yeah, Randy says he does not have a table yet. Okay. So you need to get a table. I, yeah, I, th I don't think you have enough, enough gear yet, Randy. Uh, I, I can't think of an easy way to do it no. with, uh, with a plunge router no. or even just a standard, 
standard handheld router. I'm not going to say you can't screw it up, but yeah. I'm not going to say it's going to be easy. It's going to be very, very difficult. Yeah. Um, uh, hang on. Oh, uh, how can I make a great radius on a fretboard with just a radius sanding block? This action right here. Uh, it's just lots and lots of hard work. You can certainly do it. Um, that's the way. <laughs> that's the way. One of the ways that we used to do it. Um, you had a sled set up to where the sanding block couldn't ride yep. too far either side. Yep. It would just run straight up and down because what happens is, can I see the neck? Yeah, yeah. As you're sanding, you have a tendency to... <laughs> you uh, can roll the block. Roll yeah. the block and, and so you end up with a much tighter radius on the end than here. So you end up with, yeah, 12 inch radius at the first fret and seven and a quarter here, which nobody wants. Yeah, a and, reverse. Uh, because you've, you've sort of just rolled it off. Mm -hmm. So you have to go slow and go long and even. That's and the other thing is, yeah, it's, it, you're, it's more likely that you'll push more right in the center than you will at the end. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's what's, the, what's the trick? There's no trick. It's just lots and lots and lots of, of hard work and, um, and, and constantly, constantly checking and making sure your radius is right and making sure you're, you're still flat. The people ask me if I was going to buy any of the big tools that you guys have, what would the first one be? And I'm like, after the bandsaw and after the bandsaw, I would say the neck radius jig far and away because it makes a very tedious job super easy and it's perfect every time. And you know, if, if you were to spend it, it, an hour doing this with a block versus two minutes on the radius sander, um, you, you only have to do that a few times to go, that radius sander is worth every single cent of the money for, that I spent for it. Um, and it's, this is the heart of the guitar. The body outline is not the heart of the guitar. You know, it doesn't, the, the, the shape of the body or how nice the control cavity looks or, you know, uh, any of that stuff doesn't make the guitar play any better, better or sound any better. This radius right here is 90% of this, this is the heart of the guitar and 90% of the heart of the guitar neck is getting that radius exactly right. Option two would be flat radius. No radius at all. Um, every classical guitar is flat and we've made a bunch of guitars with no radius and they play great because um, it's real, real easy to get a flat board to be flat yep. and it's harder to get one to be perfectly, you know, 10, 12, whatever inch radius all the way down and perfectly straight. Um, and then you, you start to enter in components like, oh, I want a compound radius. Everything just got a lot harder. Yeah, yeah. I can tell you that once we got a handle on making consistent, flat mm -hmm. uh, fingerboards with a, with a consistent radius on them, yep. our guitars got yep. a lot better really, really fast. Yeah. Um, and, and it was all about the consistency. Our, the previous ways that we did it weren't as consistent. Yeah. And, you know, you'd end up with one that was, was really good and one that was not quite as good. Yep. You had to do a bunch of touch up and stuff like that, and now they come out flat yeah. and perfect every time. That is not to say you can't do it with a sanding block. You yeah. certainly can, uh -huh. but it just takes it just takes work. It takes yeah a lot more time. Um, mm -hmm. And I I would even if it was me I would buy pre radiused boards. Yeah. And go that route. Yeah. From somebody that knows how to measure a radius. Because I've seen some that aren't. I've seen some that are goofy. Yeah, they, uh, yeah. There's something quirky about them, and they they might be right when they come from Ohio. I'm not digging on Ohio if Doug's watching. I'm digging on some of the things that I've seen from a place in Ohio. The time they come from Ohio to Colorado, they are not quite right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what do you? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's not the question. That was a question for somebody on here. Oh. Uh, what is CryoWire and why, why would you use it? CryoWire is regular nickel steel fret wire that has been cryogenically treated. That is to say it has been taken down to 
super, super, super cold temperatures. And apparently, uh, the cryogenic treating of metal is designed to eliminate stresses in the metal. Why would you use it? Um, because it sounds cool. The, the, the people at Stumac have told me that um, it lasts longer than regular nickel steel and is easier to work than stainless steel. Now, I can't comment on the longevity being better than, um, than regular nickel steel because we haven't been using it for that long. We've been using it for about a year. Whenever they came out with it, that's when we started using it right away. Because um, I love the idea of cryowire as a marketing tool. You know what I mean? I think so that um, anytime you can use a term like tone wood or you know oil and wax capacitor or Brazilian rosewood or stuff like that, people's ears perk up and they go, "Ooh, that's new and cool. What does it do?" Well, it wears like it wears almost as good as stainless steel and it, but it cuts as easy as nickel steel. I don't know. I, it probably doesn't last anywhere near as long as stainless, but you might get a few more cycles out of it than, um, than regular nickel steel. But mostly we use it because it, it's cool to, to say we use cryo wire. That, that's, the, that's, the, that's the honest, honest answer right there. There you go. Um, but yeah, look up cryogenically treated metal. There, there's a lot about stress relieving in that. Cool. Uh, how much is the net class in December? $199, I think. Plus shipping. Plus the shipping for the neck. It's all, on the, it's all on the website. You guys can sign up. Like I say, you get this neck and the, the class on putting in the frets and profiling the neck as well as shaping the headstock. So, yeah, you'll get something like this that Chris and I make. Yep, so we make right it. Here we send shop. it to you. You can participate in the live mm -hmm. uh, streaming class, mm -hmm. or you can just go back and watch it. You can watch it as many times as you want. You can watch it as many times as you want. So, yeah, so, you get, so it's $199, a little bit for shipping, mm -hmm. and you get the $20 class for free. Yeah, so you basically, we, we teach you how to make a neck and save you a bunch of money when, how much is the neck now from Warmoth? Uh, I think the cheapest one you can buy is like $180. Is that the cheapest yeah, one? Yeah, okay. I think so. Yeah. Maybe, I could be wrong, they might be slightly less than that. So yeah, you're probably in that, and but but you get to the knowledge is the key, guys. And yeah, you get to bond with your neck. That's a cool thing too. You yeah, get to make is. your neck the way you want. Yeah. Um, yeah. The yeah. Uh, the the other neat thing about that is, um, yeah, this is. Well, well, I don't know. I just think that I think that making stuff is cool, and buying stuff is neat. Mm -hmm. But you know, getting oh, so by the way, this these have all been radius. They come with fret wire. We'll press in the frets. Um, we'll, we'll shape the headstock, we'll do all this stuff. Um, and you can watch that video a hundred times if you want. Yeah. You can watch it a hundred million times if you want. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if your lifespan is long enough to watch a two hour video a hundred million times, but you, you can watch the video, you can speed it up, back, back it up. And, and, and if you are there live, you can go, hey, what about this? I'm, I'm having trouble with this part when I'm doing my neck. So. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a cool way to go, guys. It's a really neat way to do classes, I think. There you okay, go. Sorry about that. That's okay. Next question. Yeah. Any tips on heavy metal flake finishes? Mm, do it outside. <laughs> it gets everywhere. Um, yeah, so, so typically it's a dry, it comes as a dry powder. You mix it into some sort of clear. It's usually, they call it a mid-coat. Uh, some companies like Tamco even have a product specifically oh, for shooting. They? Okay. Yeah, for suspending um, the metal flake in it. Um, I've always had the best success with uh, old siphon feed guns rather than gravity fed guns because the the stuff just sort of gets in there and clogs it up. Yeah. Um, whereas the siphon feed, you can you can put a marble in the bottom and shake it up. You have to have a really, really big tip on the spray gun. Yeah, Probably the glitter like a has to get it has to, through there. Yeah, it has yeah. to actually get through it. And depending on the size, um, Roth Flake actually sells a, a specific gun to shoot the really, really big stuff. They make stuff. something that like actually shoots dry flake, They also flake, have something, right? yeah, yeah. And somebody the was flake talking blaster. about, yeah, yeah, about, um, you know, putting, putting something down on the body and then mm -hmm. shooting dry flake at it or sprinkling it on. Mm -hmm. You can do that. Uh, somebody was talking about G&L on here. They use a guy named Marty Bell, who's the king of 
of uh, Metal Flake, at least yeah. in, I think in California. Um, no, no disrespect to Paint Huffer. Oh, Brian right. and Paint Huffer. That's um, right. Those guys those are awesome guys know too. A lot too. Yeah, Brian and, Kennedy. Uh, and, yeah, yeah, yep. yeah. And it is messy, 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 and it gets everywhere. Yeah. And everything you paint after that will have a little bit of that metal flake in it. We, if 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 we did a lot of metal flake, I would want to have a completely separate booth mm -hmm. for doing nothing but flake. In fact, when we built our booth, I would I would have insisted we build a smaller booth that is that is for nothing but shooting flake because when we when we when we spray flake in the spray booth we have to clean it we have to, we pull everything out we replace the filter bank we pull up that we have we have uh, what's that stuff we put on the foot just a heavy cardboard yeah, stuff it's, yeah construction yeah but we uh, we put that down and we have to yank all that stuff out then we vacuum everything you can you can also you paint the inside of your but yeah your it flake gets every which way yeah, yeah. yep and then after, and so then you do that and then it's lots of clear and lots of sanding in between yep. Uh, coats of clear don't use lacquer to do any of this because it takes you can, way too much time but yeah. yeah it's it's just it's a lot of work um yeah there you go uh do you guys glue in your frets sometimes we do yeah um well, chris if you could only have one glue in the shop what would it be uh probably tight bond tight yeah. bond regular i think tight bond original we we glue in frets with super glue sometimes we glue them in with tight bond sometimes um, I prefer type on because it kind of lubricates the, the fret mm -hmm. and press it in. And if you've ever tried to get type bond off of metal, <laughs> you know that it does in fact stick. Mm -hmm. um, like, like, you know, those, those, those machinist scales that I used to clean glue, the ends of those, every single one of them in the shop yeah. is, is caked with glue crap. Mm -hmm. I glued a fret to my finger and to the board today. Or I glued my with super glue with though. super glue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I glued my finger to the fret and the board today with super glue. Now, do you always glue in frets? Uh, no. I I don't always either. Sometimes I sometimes I don't. Yeah. It, so our our tools that we cut the fret slots with mm -hmm. and that we do everything with the when the fret goes in, you can it yeah. takes a little bit of pressure to drive that fret in. Yep. It's not just wallowing around yeah. in there. And once it's in, it's in. Yeah. So I don't really feel the need to glue them yeah. in. Now, if I'm doing a refret, then I'll glue mm -hmm. them all in always. Um, yeah. So it depends on it depends on the, the the neck. Sometimes I do, and sometimes I don't. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you if you use well, really, if you use any kind of glue, it, make, it certainly makes it harder down the road mm -hmm. for the next guy to to do something to mm -hmm. it. We don't have any problems with frets coming up, so no. Yeah, I don't. That I don't all goes back to radius on your on your board. If your radius is right and your frets are radius right, and you press them in, and you don't bash them in with a hammer, you press them in with a call right, then you don't have any problems. You know what I mean? You don't you don't have any of those issues. You can always flood them with glue. People like worry about. Oh, I'm worried about the air gap that might be in. Okay, fine. Then then you should then you should definitely flow a bunch of glue in there. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, with fender style necks with a heel access truss rod, how do you drill the hole at the end so it lines up on center with the truss rod slot and at the correct distance from the fretboard surface? You just kind of got to do it. You got to measure. <laughs> yeah, you got to measure twice or three times. It, it depends on what truss rod you're using. Yeah. If you're using the, the double acting rod that like we use from Bitterroot, um, you just, I, I kind of actually lay it out to where the top of the, the fretboard is, uh, is on the base of the table, if you will. And I lay the rod out and I kind of get it just right. And I mark where it's going to go. Then I mark in the center of the neck and I poke it with a, a scratch hole. And then I drill a three eighths hole. Yep. Um, on the Bitterroot website, I believe they actually, and they, I think they, oh. they send them w with, with the, the truss rods. They actually have a diagram mm -hmm. of all the measurements and all the critical information that you would need to put that truss rod in just about any direction in any neck. They've got some now, new truss rods too. Now we didn't pay any too, any attention to way. any of that. We just we you just know, figured it out on our hip, own. Yeah, yeah. But, Bitterroot does have some new. They've got some new uh, brass block, brass end block uh, oh, truss they? rods. Yeah, oh, cool. They look pretty good. Yeah. Uh, um, so check them out. Um, and remember, Texas uh, TX Toast. At the checkout, you get 15% off from Bitterroot. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's just 
making sure that you got everything lined up just right. Um, now, what if you're scratch using all, a, a mark your hole yes. with a scratch all? Don't just yeah. shove the bit onto the wood and yep. drill. Give yep. it something to to hone in on. Sometimes we use uh, a brad point drill bit. Sometimes if I'm feeling really super cool, or if I have to go in at an angle, I use a spot facer, um, which is a specialty mill tool that, that you could put in a drill and, and use. Um, but yeah, what if you're putting in a, a vintage correct rod in a, in a curved channel? Then the, the, the rod comes out at an angle. So you've got you've to take all that stuff into consideration too. Um, some people wonder why we have this style truss rod access in the headstock, and it's because we don't use that because it's because of the truss rod that we use. Um, there's not a good way, there's not a great way to use the style of truss rod that we use, which I think is far and away superior to all the other styles of truss rod. And there, that's why we use it. We, we could use any truss rod that we want. We could make our own truss rods if we want. The, the bitter root rod is, is uh, it, it's, it's, it's the best value, the best rod, not just for the money, but if it was twice as much money, it would still be the best rod that I think. Have you ever had an issue with one? Have we ever broken one? Have we ever stripped one out? No. no. Um, and we bought hundreds of those things. Um, and there's another guitar company out there. I can't name the name, but it rhymes with measle. They use those truss rods too. I can't name them, but it rhymes with um, nailer. They use those truss rods. I can't name the school, but it rhymes with Bober Boban. And they use those truss rods. So yeah, there, there's a lot of people using those rods and it's not because they, they suck. It's because they're, they're really, really good. Yeah. Um, Cheryl told me that she sent, she sends 400 rods at a time to a company that rhymes with build and they use them exclusively on, on their, their neck. So, um, but yeah, if you're, if you're using an arched vintage rod, you, you need, you need a bunch of jigs to make that work. Right. Cool. Um, so, can you fix a cracked neck pocket and on a single cut vintage guitar bolt on neck early seventies? Uh, are you asking me if I can do it? Yes, I can. Um, are, are we talk? I'd like to know if we're talking about the the standard fender neck pocket crack, where well, it's it's, it's a lot of times it, it's more finish than than actual wood. Yeah, it, it's kind of it, it's kind of a loaded question. So I, I I shot off the answer before I really thought about it. Yeah, because for one thing, we're not doing any repair right now. So can I do it? Yeah. Will I do it? No, we're not doing, we're not taking in any repair right now because we've got so many new custom builds going that we want to focus all the energy on those. So to get repair stuff done in time, we just don't have the, the manpower to do it. Yeah, um, yeah. So let's pretend that this okay. body is cracked. Okay. Which will never happen. Um, so if you're talking about the, the crack that happens right there, you can, you can actually um, kind of clamp it a little bit. Yeah. There you go. Kind of clamp it, you know, like this or, or like this and, and wick a little bit of super glue in there. I've done that on a couple. If you're talking about this piece breaking out, which I have also seen from guitars getting dropped mm -hmm. on their heads, then yeah, you can do that, if, especially if you have all the pieces and they all fit together well, you can use wood glue and, and, and pre-fit it and then mm -hmm. put glue on it and clamp it and do all that. Yeah. Yeah. I, you, can, I, you can do it. That, that question lacks perspective. I don't know if it's, Hey, can you do it? Or will you do it? Or can it be done? You know yes. what I mean? Um, so you prefer the truss rod adjustment from the top of the neck or the spoke wheel truss rod at the bottom of the neck? I like them both. I prefer the um, I prefer the the headstock adjust because it's easier unless it's getting a Floyd. Then because you've got the locking nut and all the other accoutrement that goes at the headstock end, then that's when the um, the spoke wheel is really the hot setup. What do you think? 
Yes. Okay. I think so. <laughs> Question. You burned through the finish while sanding. How can you easily fix this? Is that Jesse? No. Is that Jesse? I'm not bringing any Halloween candy to the yeah, shop. Yeah, no, Kevin? it is not. Okay. That would be a good question for him because I've never actually burned through a finish. You burned through the color coat? <laughs> is that what it says? Uh, yeah, probably. You burned through the finish while you're sanding. Mm, boy, that's a bummer. How can you easily fix this? You really, there's not really an easy way to fix it. You have to probably, you know, at least at least feather it back and reapply. You've the had color. really good luck with color blender. Yeah, yeah, and it depends on it depends on the color. So if you're using like a, a solid color with no metallic mm -hmm. in it, it's easy to just spot fix the color and then reapply a round of clear. Or if you're using lacquer, you can just reapply a little bit of clear on the because it melts into, into the, the previous yeah. coats. Whereas modern urethanes, you really should uh, do the whole thing. Um, but yeah. It, it, there's really no easy way to do it. Okay. You have to you have to kind of go back and start over. Unfortunately, it, take, it takes some finesse and it takes some. It's 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 one of those things, guys, where it finishes the hardest part of of all of this stuff. So. Yeah, yeah, finishes finishes hard, and uh, it's easy to it's easy to screw it Before up. Before someone in the comment section says this, I don't want you to give up and say I'm going to make it a relic. Don't do that. Don't give up. Just go back and, and, and put in some, you know, kind of get your head right and, and, and go in and fix it and you'll, you'll get it. And blend it in and it's going to be great. It's just going to take some, you know, some, yeah, a, little bit, yeah. a little bit of doing and a little bit of finessing. And, and um, yeah, if you're, if you're working with like a transparent color, it's, gonna be, it's not going to be easy, but you can blend it in. So, yep. you know, give yeah. it a shot. So, so he, he followed up with burn through the clear. I could see the color getting touched, but not destroyed. So in that case, then mm. you could probably just, if you're using modern paints, scuff the whole guitar back and reshoot yep. clear. Um, the, if you're using lacquer, you can just spot, spot mm -hmm. shoot that one spot and you'd probably be okay. Yep. It puts you behind, but it won't, you know, yeah. it's, not, it's not insurmountable to get over. Yep. So yeah, hang on. There was another. There was another good one. Okay. Um, Guys, thanks for tuning in. I'd like to. I'd like to remind everybody that if they want to support the channel, they can do so um, by uh, not only just subscribing and giving us a thumbs up, but in the description below, you can buy T-shirts and mugs and all sorts of cool crap like that. And uh, one guy sent me a picture that he said, "Now I finally have a shirt that I can. I. I can be buried in." <laughs> And he looked really good in he it. He did. He looked classy. Yeah. yeah hopefully. Sexy it, AF. By the time that that comes up, that short shirt is completely worn out. Yeah. Prince right? wrote a song about how sexy he was with that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Tyler wants to know what's your favorite and least favorite style guitar to build. Favorite style guitar to build is our Texas Toast Challenger. A lot of people ask me, don't do you guys have a, a model that you? that you designed and make, and that is the, the Texas Toast Challenger, and it's my favorite to do. In fact, we've got some coming up very, very soon in reveal videos, etc. cetera. Um, what do, I, what's I'm your supposed favorite? to answer this question, too. I well, don't yeah. know that I have a, a, a least favorite guitar to build. There's some that I'm not as into as others, okay. um, but that's just sort of the nature of the, of the, the beast, I guess. Um, I have one. I have, okay. I have a least favorite. It's a genre of guitar. Okay. It's when people say, I want a, a classic something, but I want to have a different, but I want to have a, a, a pick, like, so I, I want a Telecaster, but I want to have a mini humbucker right in the middle and a lipstick pickup and, and there's all this stuff and a Floyd Rose and a this and an upside down pointy headstock and a, or a three on a side headstock on a this or a, I want a Moserite with, the P90 and a single coil or something that just doesn't go together. I, and, th and then what they always say to me is what? Wouldn't that be cool? Don't Wouldn't that, think be, that be cool? cool? And I'm like, eh, no, but if you want to pay me to do it, then I'm happy to, but it's my least favorite thing to do. Would you, what do you, what do you think? Uh, yeah, I think that's, and what, what about true. for your, do you still like, you usually like a lot of the offsets? And, yeah, I like, and, I like some of that stuff. I, you know, I like, Really, it's 
at this point, it's kind of you, you've built a guitar, you've built a guitar. Mm -hmm. um, so they're all, yeah. They're, I, don't, I don't really have a, I don't try to think of things that I don't like about guitars mm -hmm. or guitar building because I don't know that there is anything that I hate. There's things that I'd rather, you know, be done with. Yeah. I don't want to dawdle on, on yeah. them. But there's nothing that I really hate. And there's no guitars that we build that I dislike. Let's, let's, let's make sure everyone knows. If someone says, hey, I want a guitar with all these funky pickups uh -huh. and a bunch of upside down net, we'll still do that. We'll still do that all day long, right? Yes. Chris, okay. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. It's just, it's just one of our least favorite, like in terms of favorite things to do, that's not high on my list. Or if someone calls and says, I want something that, I want an exact replica of a 59 Les Paul. Well, okay, we can do that, but you could just buy that. Mm -hmm. Not, not a. You can buy. Gibson will be happy to sell you an exact replica of a '59 Les Paul, and it'll be a real Gibson. And yeah, it, the the days of of boutique builders needing to reproduce the classic shapes because the companies that made them don't make them anymore are, are gone. So, yeah, I, I get it, and I I like that slash story as much as the next guy, but. That to me is like, eh, okay, I'll do it, but I'm not, I'm not super thrilled with doing it. And it won't be any cheaper than just going and buying the, the thing that you want. Yeah, yeah. If someone wanted you to make a replica of a body, what would you need from the customer? Actual tracing, blueprint, pictures? Uh, the minimum thing we would need would be, uh, yeah, just the, a, a picture. That'd be the minimum. Um, if you could send me a tracing that's, that's the right size in every way, that would work. If you can send me a version of the guitar, then I can make a template from that. Uh, as a matter of fact, a guy sent me a, a Jackson Kelly that he wanted me, we're working on that right now. Mm -hmm. And we just, he sent, actually what he said was, um, his name is Mike, and he said, I want, I want to, how much to put a new top on my, on my guitar? And I'm like, well, you know, Mike, at that point, it'd be just as much to just make a new body. So, in fact, it'd be easier, and it might even be less money to make a new body because getting everything to line back up again is tricky. Um, so he sent me the body, and we made a template from the body, and, um, and we, we made him a, an all-new body for that. Um, so, yeah, the, um, we, but like, like I say, the minimum we would need is a picture and some dimensions. So we've done that, too, like... Um, Lance did, wanted a um, Hamer Californian. Uh, our friend Lance uh, commissioned us to build him a Hamer Californian. He didn't have one for us to, uh, to copy, so we, we had a picture, and we knew that the, the neck, we knew that the heel was exactly whatever it was, two and a quarter. So we blew the picture up until the heel was the right dimension, and then everything else matched, and we used that to make the template. Yep. So, yeah. Okay, sorry about that, you guys. Um, at least it didn't happen immediately. It might happen again. If it does, we'll, we're almost done. But yeah, so um, we, we probably have a few more minutes. We can answer a yeah. few more questions. Yeah, we can answer right? a couple more questions. Uh, somebody was, was uh, wondering what I meant by lacquer paint. And they said, oh, you mean nitrocellulose? No. Um, <laughs> nitrocellulose is one type of lacquer, um, but... Not all lacquer is nitrocellulose. Um, mostly now it's acrylic lacquer is what most places spray with very, 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 very little actual nitrocellulose content in it. Um, but it's still a lacquer-based product as, a, as opposed to a urethane-based product or Lacquer's a polyester. Like a cotton or wood fiber? Something. Nitrocellulose? Yeah. Um, yeah, they usually make it, and, and make no mistake, it's still plastic. Um, it's just not a very stable plastic. Um, and it's made out of, yeah, out of chemically modifying wood or cotton okay. into plastic. Um, yeah, and urethane is another type of plastic, and polyester is another kind of plastic. And that's what all these paints are based on. They're all, they're all plastic. Mm -hmm. It's just how do, you, how do they um, get soluble, and how do they, um, yeah, what, what, what's their makeup? How do you how do you uh, thin it and how do you what's what's its chemical makeup? So yeah. anyway, yeah, lacquer versus urethane. Did our friend in Texas urethane. ask us that? Um, no, <laughs> no. 
Uh, here's a good one. Bone nuts versus brass nut. Your thoughts? Did I see a hollow body template on the wall? E, probably. You did probably see a hollow body template on the wall. Um, bone versus brass. I sure do like working with bone way more than brass. Brass is, it, it, it's just, it's harder to cut. And I don't, I don't really see the payback. Mm -hmm. um, I think those zero glide nuts would be, uh, would be a cooler option if you wanted all the open strings to sound the same as the fretted strings. But yeah, I think I like bone better. Or a, or a zero fret. Or just a zero yeah. fret. But if you have a guitar already. If you already, have a guitar already. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you sell bodies and necks? Yes and no. Um, we, we do sell bodies and we do sell necks, but um, I don't sell every single body and every single neck. So if you have a specific question about a body or neck that you want, please send me an email and I'd be happy to get you a quote going. There you go. Last question. Okay. So you can shape a thin neck like a Jackson or an Ibanez? Y yes. Yes. Yeah, we can. Um, I'm, yeah, not, we can, I'm not sure what... We can make a neck any, yeah. any profile that you want, as long as you know what you want. Yeah, all of our necks are done... You need to done... know some, some measurements or at least have something you mm -hmm. can tell us, like, oh, I want an Ibanez wizard neck. Yeah. Okay. Or I want a... Or I want a... I want a V neck. Yeah, I want a V or I want a, yeah, uh, a standard or C. you can take some calipers and your neck and you can go, okay, at the first fret, it's 800 thousandths. And at the second fret, it's 805 thousandths. And at the third, and you can go all the way down and tell us that. And then you can get a, a, a yeah, yeah, we can, we can shape your neck any way that you want. Um, because all of our necks are done one at a time. We just need to know what it is precisely that you want. Mm -hmm. And there's some different constructions on some of those thinner necks, so we mm -hmm. need to know that up front. You can't yeah, tell us that's, after the fact. That's true. Generally, that's what, what we'll do want. is we will cut into the fretboard um, a little bit and cut into the neck a little bit, and the truss rod will kind of be wedged in between those two things. And that way we can get that Ibanez Wizard is like 750 thousandths. It's like, it's, it's really slim. Might even be less than that. I can't remember. But yeah, to get, to get a neck that's that slim, um, we need to, and still work with our truss rod, we need, to, uh, we need to know that you want it that slim. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So guys, thanks for watching uh, the Thursday Live Guitar and uh, Building and Repair Q&A. Uh, it's always cool to hang out with you guys and do this. It's I, I'm really having a good time with yeah, this. Yeah, they're and fun. I, I hope that you guys are too. I hope that we're getting your questions answered. I'd like to thank our sponsors, Flipside Music, the great American guitar store, Bitterroot Guitars. Remember, if you type in T-X-T-O-A-S-T -T -T at checkout, you get 15% off your purchase, the entire thing. Uh, I'd like to thank Guitarwood Experts, Dan and the guys over there, super cool people. And I think that the Texas Toast 15 code is still in play. Um, let me know if you guys are having trouble with that. I'd like to thank Mike Learn at Mike Learn Airbrush and Mike Learn Guitars and SimTech Coatings for helping us out, bringing you the live podcast. Um, guys, we'll see you next Thursday. If you, you like this kind of thing, check out our Sunday live stream. It's like this, only way more beers, and uh, it's just a lot of kind of goofing around. I don't know what we're going to talk about this week, but I have some ideas. I just haven't, I, I haven't gotten them written down in front of me. So um, let me know how the mics worked out. And until next time, this is Matt at Texas Toast. And that's Chris reminding you that if you're so smart, build it yourself. That's what we do. Thanks for watching, you guys. We'll see you next time. See you guys.